No my Heidi Mai and welcome to this council meeting of the 28th of March. Welcome to elected members, uh, iwi representative, uh, our audit risk and assurance committee members who are sitting at the table today. Uh, welcome to council staff, members of the public, people who are joining us online. I'll now move to Kim Tahiwi to uh, perform our council blessing for us. Thank you. Kia ora tato. Um, I a mātou e whiriwhiri ana i ngā taki kei mua i o mātou aroaro. E pono ana mātou ka kaha tonu ki te whakapau māhara. Hua pai mō ngā hāpuri, mō ngā hāpuri e mahi nei mātou. Me kaha hoki mātou ka toa, kia whaihua, kia tōtika tā mātou mahi. A, mā te maia, te tiro whakamua me te hihiri, ka taia te arahi i roto i te kotahitanga me te aroha. Kim. Do I have any apologies to record today? I have in front of me uh, Glenn Olson from the Paraparumu Community Board. We have Guy Byrne attending in his stead. Do I have any other apologies? I'm looking to democracy services. I'll ask for somebody to move that apology, moved by Councillor Kirby, seconded um, Councillor Coford. All in favour, please say aye. 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 That's carried. Are there any declarations of interest relating to items on the agenda? There don't appear to be any. Nothing under five or six. So we'll move now to public speaking time for items relating to the agenda. And I have a few listed today. I'd welcome first to the table, uh, David Ogden. Og Ogden. Welcome, David. So uh, I'll keep quite strictly to time for public speaking time today because we have a heavy agenda where we're passing various documents to a long-term plan. So Thank you very much. Three minutes is a nonsense. Uh, I'm here on Thank behalf you, of the Grey Power and uh, uh, I just want to talk about rates um, and the long-term plan. First of all, kia ora and bonjour, David Chand, who I know from long, a few years ago. Good to see you, Dave. Thanks for the chat. I just want to talk about something uh, about the rates. First of all, I may be quite wrong, but I noticed that in reading through the papers, not all of them, but some of the papers, that there was an amount of $25 million for the Hakara Arawata plan, which is a huge amount and should be deferred or cancelled at the moment, and the developers should be more involved in it. It's a good example of the, in the, pre in the previous um, triennium where the building on the corner of Capity Road and State Highway 1 was bought has been demolished. Probably one to two million and rates about 16,000 in my view. I just want to read something very quickly because of the time constraint. I'll try and leave out references to me. I got very angry as a professional body and somebody wrote about what we, what we did. The, uh, a particular council that I was involved with was the most indebted council in the country for capital rating levels or high resident risk, satisfaction was poor, uh, and major infrastructure investments were needed. We had a formal team that fronted these challenges. The need for a very effective financial management and united approach was required and delivered by us, a team. The council is an executive team of the council. The achievements included substantially reducing debt, completing major infrastructure improvements to get the 100% of scheduled asset renewals and improving resident satisfaction best practice, all the while limiting rate increases to the level of inflation, which is a challenge for you. And you're all nice people, but some of you don't, well, I've said what I've said about that before. Determination more than a decade of consistent focus said to the City Council's results being recognised by business excellence assessors. This culminated in achieving a gold award from the New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation with the highest ever score shortly, uh, I won't go into that bit, Many, many national and international delegations visit the council to learn from the strategies and processes used to achieve these awards, award-winning results. And if anybody wants to talk to me about who that might be, I can pass the name of that person on and might be able to help you. Um, most important of all, the residents have benefited from this transformation and substantial improvements delivered, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it can happen. 
you can do something about the rates in this place and uh, help the uh, people who reside here. And as you know, there's been a push by the uh, Great Power Group to have a view about that and to bring it to high focus. As far as I can see, the councils around the country, how much time we've got? Half a minute? I'll, I'll let you finish the, the point that you're on. That, that's yeah. fine. Well, generally, I think that there is a lack of determination, planning, success, and it is needed at this time. Uh, that's all the time I've got, actually, I suppose. But thank you very much. Thank you so much for your contribution today. Do I have any questions from elected members? There don't appear to be any. Thanks so much, David. Uh, Good to see you again. Oh, <laughs> Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Um, David, is Grey Power making representations to Greater Wellington? I see their proposed rate rises 19.8%. I know, it's, it's almost scandalous and extraordinary. I mean, um, I think there are being, uh, there are being um, representations made, yes, I can answer in that respect. I mean, great, um, the regional council hides behind their rates being collected by people such as you. you they pay you a fee. And I just never see anything about the regional council locally, but I may be missing something great that I should be aware of. The regional council is like a, they're, they're a hidden mystery, you know. They just haven't got the highest enough profile in my view. And Auckland did the right thing in some ways by making it United Council, the Regional Council and the other councils. But they've got their own pickles as well. Any other questions? Yeah, they sure do. Mr Byrne. There's somebody over here, I think. Yeah, Mr Byrne. Yeah, thank you for that, David. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think it's way too high, the present figure. Uh, but what you suggest is a reasonable amount for a rates increase in, in our current uh, economic environment. Well, you've got what we said um, was the rate of inflation, but that, which at that time was two and a half percent. We added a half percent on that. But the, the, the rate of inflation at the moment is is coming down thanks to the dreadful uh, but effective way of the Reserve Bank, which I think should be disestablished. And um, although David Chan may have a view about that. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the current rate of inflation plus half percent would be a goal. You've got to set goals. I think at the moment I heard someone saying, oh, we've got to uh, push the rates up in this first year of triennium so that we'll be re-elected. I, I, I th if you don't get the rates under control, I don't think some of you are nice people deserve to be re-elected because you haven't achieved what you want to or should have wanted to. For the about 4%. Four? Half percent. Well, I, no. Well, when it gets down there, it's not there at the moment. No. At the moment, the rate of inflation plus, plus say half percent. Whatever it should be, have a goal. At the moment, you're looking what? What is your rate at the moment? I think it's about fifteen, isn't it? Any further questions? Just checking. There was one over here, I think. No. Anyway, the great power questions? people are not very happy. Thank you for sharing your opinion with us That's today, right. David. Thank you. I welcome Conrad Peterson. Uh, just, just wait, wait for the microphone for the purposes of live streaming. Hello. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll be brief. I will be noting. Um, making a comment on this draft financial strategy 23-24 which I'm sure everybody around the table is totally familiar with but we'll go directly to page 7 2.2 we're facing some big challenges no three waters reform debt repayment now is everybody familiar with uh, <coughs> the paragraph I'm speaking about Everybody got it? Otherwise, I can read it out. Pardon? I'll talk to it. I am astonished, appalled to read in this draft financial strategy that there was 
an unprecedented opportunity for council to significantly reduce its debt, which is no longer going to happen. I just cannot believe that this organisation went through 2023 without realising that Three Waters would be reversed by a change in government. And a change in government, frankly, was obvious well at the start of 2023. Now, what was your plan B? There wasn't a plan B, that's obvious. Now, frankly, uh, without wishing no disrespect, it shows, in my view, a lack of competence There has to have been somebody in this council that put their hand up and said, what do we do if it doesn't happen? Obviously, they weren't listened to. I can only hope, frankly, that KCDC can do a little better in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Peterson. Any questions? Councillor Wilson. Um, yeah, uh, questions only. Yep. Um, the, so you, want to, you probably haven't, you won't have seen the draft uh, uh, long-term plan. This is the draft financial strategy out of the documents about that, sir. Oh, right. Are yeah. we talking about yeah. the same thing? Yes, yeah, it's similar. It's a, um, it's yeah, so right. obviously there's a bit to wade through, but there is, you, you, um, so you might not have noticed that there's a um, significant pay down of debt strategy that's in there. I'm sorry, there's a significant pay down of debt. There's a strategy for paying down debt, not in this first year, but for all of the out years in the long term plan. But uh, so, Mr. Oh, Peterson wouldn't have had a chance to see that document. Yes, it, it, yes, yes, it's all in the suite of documents that that was a part of. So yes, oh, right. he's had a chance yeah. to see it. I haven't had time to go through all yeah, the documents. Sure. Understandable. Um, yep. But um, <clears throat> so what you're saying is that there is. Oh, okay. Please don't, Miss David. It is David, isn't it? Nigel. Nigel. But you can call me David okay. if you like. Most of the room's called David. I guess um, <laughs> we may be talking a little at cross purposes here. I'm not arguing with, or I'm not debating the fact that the council needs to uh, to retire debt. I don't think there's any question about that. My concern, pure and simple is you have a draft strategy which says uh, we were counting oh, we were counting on getting money when you shouldn't have been counting on it. You should have had a plan B. Now, you're not the only council in the country that's in this situation, uh, but councillors need to step up and do better. Thank I think you your point time. is well made. Thank you. Uh, Mr Burrows, Kevin Burrows. Good morning, everyone. Uh, right. Want to talk about two issues over the long term plan and the council test today. One, the first one would be water reform, and the other one would be older persons housing. Now, on water reform, as we understand, and we had a debate of the older persons, for those who don't know me, I'm the chair of the older persons council. Uh, we had a debate about this in the older persons council yesterday, and in particular, the 5%. We don't, we agree with the 5% because we worked her out at 4 or 5%, actually. But the 5% is going on the general rates. Now, there are two types of rates that people there's the general rate and the water rate. We thought it would be more transparent to shift, it, to shift that 5% to the water rate. The, it's about water reform. Appreciate that at present, that water rate is for the drinking water, but you still got the sewerage and the storm water in there. But if you, shift, if you use that money on the water rate, it's spread 
it spread more evenly because everybody uses pays the water rates for you've only got rate payers and uh, you're setting the process for, for that so we thought it was, and it's more transparent about what's going to happen with us i think the five percent is about 40 if i got it right with 40 odd million or something uh, so it is more transparent and we'd like council to consider that no, it's probably a issue for the accountants to shift the <laughs> to shift the money around, but that's it. With the older persons housing, we believe that council, and I'm sure you've discussed this, but need to make it very very plain that for those residents that are already in there, there will be. The pre present formula, if you like, will be carried over and uh, for setting the rents. All the rights and obligations would be carried over. There is one exception to that, that as I understand that council are negotiating with governments about income related rents no, for those, those residents. If that applies, it would lower the, the rents. And uh, so as, uh, as a minimum, we want the, and it should be made plain in writing to them, that the present system would carry on as, as a minimum. If the income re related rents is managed by council, and it would be great if you could do that, then that would apply there. But that needs to be done in writing with them. They need to receive a letter, or they need to have it included in the trust deed or wherever. With all due respect, I'm sure you've talked about this, and I'm sure it's uh, an issue, but what happens in three years? You, none of us may be around in three years or six years or 12 years time when it, you know, when people will recall this. So it needs to be recorded quite clearly about that. The, uh, just the other issue is uh, I've been saying to, uh, various people around council that elected members need to visit the uh, residents in these homes to explain the issues and I understand that's happening so I'm very pleased with that and uh, I'd have to say you got some credits at the OPC for doing that yesterday. May not have agreed with you but, but the fact that you showed up you got some credit for that. Now, but once a decision is made, whatever that decision is, we believe that the elected members should go back and explain that decision to people. You know, you, you are the elected members, you represent these people, we think it's important that you front up and tell them the issues. That's it. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, we've certainly enjoyed going around and visiting the older person's res uh, residents. And, um, yeah, very happy to do it again, definitely. Um, I'll go to Councillor Halliday. Um, two things. Um, look, thanks for coming in. Um, just making sure you guys are going to submit into the long-term plan um, because you know, I, I certainly want to hear these points of views and I prefer to get a nice, clear understanding of what you're talking in, in relation to and it's great to see that in the written form. So I'd really appreciate uh, the submission going in. And just wanted to confirm uh, what the Mayor was saying. Uh, we've just been around, and I've been to quite a few of them, uh, having cups of tea with all the residents throughout the uh, um, throughout the um, Capital District that are in our older persons housing. We had a very good turnout. Uh, explained things, made it very, very clear that their um, tenure would be uh, protected and is safe, uh, because that was my big concern, that people might be thinking that it wouldn't be. Um, but we'll be certainly um, keeping them informed through the process, not just by sending a letter, but actually going and having a chat with them as well. We have that, that worked very, very well. Um, and, um, yeah, looking forward to doing it again further on down the track. I had that same thought, actually, about wanting particularly that first point around water, um, having that in writing so that I could understand the suggestion more clearly and feed that into the process. That would be great. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Um, thank you for coming today. Did, um, did the Older Persons Council come to a sort of a consensus whether moving the older people housing into entity was a good idea? What was sort of the general theme and feedback? The from general theme is uh, 
a majority do think it's a, a good I cautiously agree with it. Uh, because we're looking at this as a step back. There are, there are a minority who want the status quo, I have to say. But we're looking at it as a step by step process. You know, we're, we're, it is an important issue for, for everybody concerned, not only for the residents, but there's a longer waiting list that's happening. Than we, yeah. And that's the issue for a lot of people about how we build more older persons' housing. In the, in there. So yes, there is a, uh, a majority view that happens, but the bottom line is what for us is what we've just said. I uh, just said is that about the issue of maintaining the rent for those residents. So, so there's two issues. I think the the present residents need to be. Uh, told and confirmed and reassured that everything's going on. But yes, we need to have a look at, there's a growing growing number of, uh, of people waiting on that waiting list and we need to make provision for that. For that. So there, there is a consent, uh, a majority saying in the, in the, to move, move that way. And we will be making a submission in there, but Unfortunately, I won't be here because I'll be overseas, and mm -hmm. so it'll be just a written submission, I suspect. For us. Thank you. Yeah, I think that um, the concerns around ring fencing the older people's housing when it is moved into the NT ring fence and perpetuity for older people so, is, um, is Councillor Cooper. I just, I just one that caution you about making comments about the outcome of the long term plan no, no, when not, we're about I'm to not, release I'm the not, I'm just, just saying just it's a challenge for. It's just a challenge, yeah. and um, in input from the older people will be vital in making those decisions. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Sorry, just, thank just, you. Just we've got to be really careful through this process. Yeah. The hard yeah. word from our yeah. risk and assurance thank you. Thank you. members this morning. <laughs> Councillor Gofford. Yes, I'd, I'd just like to re reassure uh, the, the pensioners that uh, this, this council has a very caring attitude to towards the uh, pensioner housing with some 230 houses. and. We're um, currently looking at uh, a lot of refurbishment, which is subsidised uh, quite heavily by council. But yeah, communications number one, and uh, look forward to your uh, submission on all of that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Coford. Right. Thank you so much, Kevin. And it's great you could come today if you're not going to be around for the hearing, so that we could hear your point of view. That brings us to the end of public speaking time. Just double checking there's nobody else in the gallery that would like to share anything with us today. Okay. So we move on to members' business. Leaves of absence can be, inf I can be informed of those. Um, I haven't been informed of any matters of an urgent nature. We have nothing under item nine, so we'll go straight on to item 10, which is our reports. We have quite a few of them today. And it's a pivotal day in our long-term plan preparation as we adopt the draft, hopefully. And I'll welcome to the table. Mark de Haas. So uh, before I pass over to staff, we have Sam Nicol, who's been uh, part of the auditing process of this report online. So um, he has a, a few words to share with us. So I'll go to him now. Him? Thank you, Sam. Me. You can hear me all right? We can hear you fine. Thanks for, co thanks for coming in. Well, apologies I couldn't join in person. So... Um, Look, just a couple of comments from us. As you know, uh, in our role as appointed auditor of the council on behalf of the Auditor General, we also have a role uh, in auditing the consultation document and the long-term plan. The LTP process, which commenced last June, has been a challenging process for all local authorities with the uncertainty 
uh, of last year's election and the scope of water reform. This has resulted in significant change uh, to include water related assets indefinitely due to the repeal of the Water Services Entities Act in, reverse, in effect reversing the affordable waters reform. So a bit of a moving target for officers uh, as they've had to grapple with the requirements for any consultation document. Officers have prepared the consultation document and related documents incorporated by reference, which are included in your pack today, supported by a program of workshops and discussions with members. Uh, and alongside that, we've completed our audit work, which has been focused on auditing the consultation document and whether it gives effect to the legislative requirements to enable effective public participation in Council's 2024 long-term plan process. I'm pleased to say we've concluded our work with the document before members reflecting satisfactory resolution of our comments and those from the Office of the Auditor General's hot review process. So subject to proceedings this morning, we're in a position to issue an unqualified audit report on the consultation document and the form of that is included in draft in the papers. Thank you, Sam. Um, I might um, I might open the floor to questions if anybody has any questions of Sam before I move on to Mark. Would that be okay, Mark? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions before Sam has to duck out? Now's your opportunity. Well, thanks for zooming in today, Sam, and also for all the work that's gone into getting us to this point. We're very pleased to have an unqualified um, document today so and I realize that's been an iterative process so thanks to you and the team for the work that's gone in. You're welcome and I'm able to stay for a little bit so I'll carry on while council considers uh, business and just drop off when I need to leave. That's great thanks Sam. Thank you. So I'll pass over to Mark now. Thank you your worship. Morning everybody. Um, so um, fantastic news, we've just heard from Sam, so we have an unqualified audit opinion on the consultation document. Um, I'd say probably the champion of this report is the consultation document. Um, there's lots of recommendations um, because the consultation document itself is supported by lots of supporting information. So that, that's a requirement under legislation. So um, subject to your approval today of the consultation document, um, we would start public consultation today. So we would, um, we would um, at the conclusion of this meeting, we would make any minor edits um, as discussed today. We would attach the um, signed audit opinion that would go onto the council website. And then the supporting information goes onto the council website as well, is because that has to be on the website. Um, but the document that is put into the public domain at our libraries and our service centres um, is the consultation document. So that is the front facing part of the long term plan. So um, I'll take the report as read, noting that there might be lots of questions on the, all the attachments. So, um, so back to you, Your Worship. Thanks, Mark. Um, Darren, did you have anything to add at this point before we move into questions? <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. I really just add to Mark's comments, this has been a challenging process. Um, the work that has gone in collectively from council officers and council laws, uh, I think is a credit to where we find ourselves today. So um, very challenging times as we've heard from Sam at EY, but we're not alone in the challenges. This is something that has been faced nationally uh, and there are bigger problems in relation to funding and how we solve that funding problem that will continue to challenge local government as we look for different ways of proving affordability uh, and generational equity, I think is a really big challenge for us. So uh, happy to take questions as we travel. I'll go to Councillor Coe. Yes, thank you. Um, the consultation document is looking absolutely fabulous. <laughs> well done. Um, I have a question on the supporting information on page 62. Uh, of our 368-page appendix, uh, which I read in detail last night. Um, <laughs> page 62, there's reference to the self-insurance fund. Um, I had thought we were not pursuing that idea any longer. I just wondered why that line item is still in there. We'll just find the reference. Page 62. 
It's under new assets and upgrades, self-insurance fund. We're looking at page 62. The appendices. So you're looking at the consultation document. Well, the, the, it's all wrapped up in one. You've got all support information, the consultation thing is at the end. But it's a, a separate appendix, appendix yes. under a separate cover. Yep, we know yeah. where you are. Yep. Yep. Oh, so um, so thank so thank you thank thank you, councillor. Um, it's 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 probably actually. Um, a naming change that needs to happen. So, so currently, what the council has is it rates it rate funds $150,000 a year uh, for our small fund, which we call self insurance fund. And then in our right. capital works program, we have budget provision of $250,000 a year, um, which then just carries <coughs> over. So, what what we're seeing in the agenda there is we're seeing in our capex the provision that we have within our overall program of $71 million. We set aside a little bit of money uh, for repairing assets a as a result of uninsured losses. So, right. um, so it's not self-insurance in the sense that we've been discussing it no, through the consultation? No, no. So okay. we, we probably to need to that. update that. So yeah, yeah. thank you yep. for pointing okay. that out. Right, thank you. Okay. That would qualify as a minor editorial change. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Wilson? Yeah, I was quite pleased to see self-insurance in there. It's just hoping the numbers that have been higher. I, I get a, a question for Sam. <coughs> Sam's still with us. Um, in relation to self-insurance, I understand there was some kickback from audit about self-insurance. I was just wondering, was um, uh, just putting a bit of flesh on on audit's uh, bones regarding self-insurance, was there an issue in relation to self-insurance or was it the level that audit had, a, had an issue with? Look, thanks for the question. Uh, whether or not to proceed with uh, any policy decision is a matter for council. Our feedback uh, was intertwined with our overall uh, comments on the consultation document at that stage around affordability and how that had been considered. And the dimensions that related to self-insurance were uh, with the level of rates related to the draft proposal at that time, what consideration had been given to alternatives, such as you know, retaining debt headroom rather than pre-funding any self-insurance funds so you could have a higher deductible uh, without rate funding in advance. Uh, the call you might make on council's own capital rather than insurance. So that was one of the elements that um, we discussed with officers uh, prior to the updated proposal that saw it being removed. Right. And and just a, a final one for you, Sam. Is what was the what would have been the tipping point for uh, for an unqualified audit as far as the numbers were concerned? So like eleven percent, nine percent. Was there a particular number that, that affordability that you felt was a tipping point? No, we, um, it's a little bit of the dark arts of auditing, but it's, you know, it's not a mechanical exercise. The challenge uh, we put to management was how have you thought about affordability and intergenerational equity in your proposals uh, as presented in the draft we considered. And at some point we ran into the question, well, how realistic is it? And so taking on board that uh, and other feedback, management had another look and we got it an, up, an updated consultation document. But we were challenged by, you know, there is a question as to the economic capacity of the community uh, to afford the rate rises that were being contemplated. Um, and at some point that may be so significant it would impact our audit report. Great. No, no, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Mr Burns, is your question for Sam or for Mark? Uh, it's, I've got two questions for each. One question for each. So page uh, three, uh, 353, page 353 of the report, of, of the appendix, sorry. Of the appendix, yep. yep. And it's to Sam. Uh, around affordability. So Sam, I see the council here 
uh, using 7% of household income as a basis of affordability as opposed to the Shan report's recommendation of 5%. What's your feeling on that or your thoughts about that, please? Are you happy to take that, Sam? Yeah, thanks for the question. I believe there was some discussion at the last Risk and Assurance Committee um, where we had the benefit of David Shand, who acts in the chair of that committee, where he offered some perspectives on uh, the continued suitability of that 2007 report over time. Um, but we, we don't have a hard and fast view on affordability. It's a policy choice for council as to what to aim at uh, and is one of the dimensions we need to consider in forming our overall opinion on the consultation document. Thank you. And you had a question for Mark as well? A question for Mark. And Mark, uh, in relation to the same strand or theme, uh, um, what's the basis for, for, for the 2% rise as opposed to the Shan report? Bearing in mind, cause it seems to be, just reading it, that you're saying because it was established 17 years ago, now we'll increase it. But because it's a percentage, it's, it, it shouldn't be affected by time. So I, I don't fully understand the rationale. Are you happy to take that, Mark? Yes, through, through, you, through you, Your Worship. Um, so the basis, the basis is that the 5% was 17 years ago. And um, so we believe that in terms of the economic environment, it's changed. Um, the financial strategy sets out our discussion on um, affordability, and so the five percent was seventeen years ago, and we then fast forward a further ten years. So we're looking at affordability at the end point, which is thirty three, thirty four. So we're talking twenty seven years, and so the two percent isn't based on any rationale other than the passage of time. Um, but we look at the median household income. And as the financial strategy sets out, that um, that the uh, projected <coughs> average rates as a percentage of median household income in 3334 sits at 7.5%. And at the moment, the consultation document is trying to strike a balance between affordability and actually achieving the goals of the long-term plan to build a resilient future per capita. So it's the passage of time and the fact that today's economic environment has changed so substantially. We, we believe that a 2% inflation on a 5% over 27 years is, is fair and reasonable. And is that 7% for this year, or is it, is it a, a permanent uh, so change? The, so the 7% has been used as at 3334. Yeah. So we've looked at... So the big part of, of the proposal in the consultation document is to reduce debt. And so if you have if you have a 17% rates increase in year one and 7% rates increase from years two to 10, at that point, if you look at what, what will the rates be in 10 years time, so that's where we're using. So that 7% is a measure at 33, 34, 20, 20, 33, 34. Yeah, I'll, so I'll, hang, hang on a minute. Um, we happen to have David Shan sitting at the table here, so, and he would like to comment. Thank you. So I'll allow that. Hang on, just gun, just just wait wait for the microphone. Sorry. Wait for the, we want to hear what you got to Sorry. say. Well, it's very nice to be under the gun so much so early in the meeting. Um, but let me just comment, based on what I said before at at a previous meeting, that this calculation, this figure of ten, five percent, developed in in uh, two thousand and seven was the first attempt where we were first basis, the first time there had been a real attempt to, to pseudo-scientifically, if that's a term, relate this to incomes and assets and come up with a figure. But as I said at the previous meeting, uh, we would not claim that it is perfect or that it's necessarily highly scientific. It was simply necessary that some guideline be established, right? And, uh, and if any council wants to adopt a different guideline, so be it. But it should know what it's doing, and it should have some relationship to uh, any studies that have been done on asset levels and income levels and, uh, across grid patterns and all that sort of thing. So it's up to council to make that decision. There was nothing, nothing, this is not handed down in stone. 
and it was as I said it was done in 2007. Uh, rates of inflation then were, I might say, significantly lower, particularly in terms of the, of the costs, um, local government cost index, which has not been referred to this morning, but which is really what is very important in relation to the CPI. The, the local government cost index is not the same as the CPI. It's, in fact, significantly higher. So uh, it's really up to this council to make a decision. Uh, the important thing is that you have some guideline to, 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 uh, uh, to work to, noting that this is a subjective issue and it's a judgment issue. It's a judgment issue. It's not a scientific issue, even though there is some calculations and, and uh, analysis behind the 5% figure. It does not necessarily have to be held to. I hope that helps the discussion. Yeah, thanks. That, that's, that's really useful and uh, it's incredible to have you at the table to make that comment firsthand. I'd remind councillors too that we're not making a decision about this today. We're releasing a consultation document. <coughs> Councillor Cooper. Um, I actually have some questions to, uh, to Guy, so um, thank you for um, asking those questions, Guy, and the answers. If um, we actually, as a council, decided that 5% is, in terms of affordability, that we, we're not comfortable with the 7%, how would that impact the, the economic strategy? How would that actually impact on your graphs and stuff? And the debt reduction. Yeah, this is something we went through in some detail at the last briefing, but um, yep. I'll ask Mark to try and summarise where we got to with that. We'll just push the debt out longer. Yes. Yeah. So through you, Your Worship. Short answers. Um, so in the consultation document, um, the significant change proposal to reduce debt sets out um, the impacts of 8%, it sets out the impacts of 7%, and it also sets out the impacts of 6%. So the, the short answer is there is a significant difference between 7% and 6%. Um, so um, if, you, if, you, if council decided to go lower than 7%, then you won't be reducing debt as much, your annual interest cost will be higher, and the weekly interest cost will be higher. 7% um, was deemed to be... Um, when we looked at affordability, it was sitting at 7.5%, but it allowed you to, re to reduce your debt significantly as well as your annual interest charges. So the, the benefit to the ratepayers at 7% um, was significant compared to 6% to, and can compared to 5%. So the short answer to the question, if you go lower, you will carry higher debt and higher interest charges. Great, thank you. Uh, just one more question, which is right down in the weeds where I don't normally like to be. But uh, on page 64 of the appendix, if you look at Otorara Park, asset renewal, um, that expenditure line, what, can you just explain that to me? Because I thought we weren't, apart from uh, some drainage out there, we weren't spending money on Otorara Park. Page 64. Parks and open spaces. Thank you. Um, look, our understanding is that that budget provision uh, for renewals is for mainly drainage and maintenance. It's in th that's in thousands. It seems a lot, is that? Is that sh maybe Sean can explain that? Because I thought we were, I thought we were spending three hundred odd thousand, and that was about it. It was done, but this is millions. Oh, I've got a, Sean's going to give a response. This is like four million. So I've got a response from, I've got a response from Mr. Mallon. So I, I can't pull up the table at the moment, but um, there's certainly no significant. Oh, in the years three, year four to ten. So that there is some existing infrastructure there. Um, I'd have to check as to what was actually included in those out years in terms of um, renewals because certainly I'm not aware of anything major there in terms of significance that would link to potentially that, that amount of funding. So we'll double check and make sure those figures are right. Thank you, Councillor. Mm. 
Next we have uh, Councillor Warwick. I'm just wondering in the CapEx asset renewals and new hold on, new assets and upgrades, um, there's no OTP library, which was actually, or can you tell me where it is? Because it was supposed to be in year four or five. There's no, there, were quite, there was quite a few million dollars in the last long-term plan. Sorry, I'm struggling with technology. Just today. There you go. So, no, what, sorry, could you repeat the question, Councillor? Was it a, a funding for Otaki Library upgrade? Yes. You can't find a reference to it in the, because I wasn't aware that we had. Uh, it would have been, it has been pushed out in terms of the overall program. If you'd like to, I can source that line item. Okay, we'll carry on because we have the documents in front of us. We can't be adding line items um, on the fly. Yeah. So, my, the understanding I have at present is that's, that it's been pushed out. We might have more information coming. Again, if you give me an opportunity, I'll, I'll certainly look to see where it sits in the, in the program at the moment. If it's not printed here, then... I wasn't aware it was pushed out longer than 10 years, but... Okay, I'll just seek some guidance. Yeah. Councillor Coford. Oh, thank you, Worship. Uh, just, just to preempt a few questions from the community, uh, we, we have a big spike in the OK rates uh, next time at 17% uh, and then it stabilises or settles down at 7% for the next uh, few years till 30, uh, 2034. Um, just given pre previous trienniums have sort of campaigned on this, uh, you know, they spike the rates to pay off, um, you know, debt and that gets the rates down subsequently. Um, it seems to be a historic thing. Is there um, any um, margin in that for any surprises or any guarantee that it will stabilise at 7% just generally? Through you, Your Worship. Um, generally, generally, no. Um, we, haven't, we haven't factored into our budgets the contingency for growth. Um, but what, what, the, what the financial strategy does show is it shows that across years two to ten, your average rates increase is four percent, and so that's how the strategy is enabling debt reduction by capping or topping up to seven percent. So the budgets don't provide. So they obviously has inflation um, it, it, embedded in our asset management plans and our capex budget and some of our opex is um, is to is, is to um, service population growth, um, but in terms of um, unforeseen. Um, events, no. Um, but but this whole this whole strategy is 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 based on um, not an average rates increase of four, but an average rate, average rates increase of seven. So your um, the limits, the quantified limits on rates is um, between six and eight percent, with the preferred seven. But um, there isn't there isn't a budget provision for uh, things that we don't know about. We don't have. Um, uh, money um, tucked away in those budgets for, for cost increases other than inflation um, and, and some growth. Thanks for that. Thanks. Sorry. Can I just put one, one more question? Um. I'll just wait for Councillor Coburn's microphone to come back. <coughs> they just take a little. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just uh, further to that, you just um, referred to uh, growth. 
and uh, government have anticipated lots of growth, you know, tier one for intensification, which I think they're backtracked on. But anyway, is there um, are, are there more or is there more funding uh, from the developers with uh, you know development levies and things like that? Um, and uh, you know, what part of the developments or do ratepayers have to fund these new developments very much? Um, so do we get more money from you know, um, development levies from these big uh, developments with uh, you know, lots of extra. Did you get that, Sean? Do you need the question repeated? <coughs> Could you okay. Summarise that question again, okay. please. Okay, we we uh, we're talking about future development and how government said that you know we we're tier one intensification, so we, you know big development in the area over the next few years. Um, is this being catered for with uh, development levies that the um, developers have to pay, um, or and what percentage would the ratepayer have to pay for? Um, Infrastructure, you know, for for you know, subsequent years. Well, we have a development contributions policy as part of our pack of papers. I'd direct yeah. the councillor to that to answer that question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who's next? Have we got? Uh, I think we've got an answer to the Otaki Library and Service Centre upgrade. <laughs> Lost it again. So it, it is in the. Um, Jean, you might, you, you, if you can answer it there, if you've got the page reference, it's probably easier. Thank you, Jean. Right. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so Otaki Library is in the community facilities on page 61 of the. Um, report and it's under museum and the theatres you'll see the big items in year four five six seven eight that's for the majority of it is Otaki library because I thought the auditors queried it must be there um, so it's under community facility and then we also have Waikana library is under recreation and the leisure activity uh, which is on page 65. Yeah, so the two libraries are in different places yep, two by different virtue things. of the fact that Autaki Theatre has the uh, earthquake issues mm. and is part of that same project. That so right? they, yeah. that's right, Your Worship, mm. and they've been, uh, the, the way they've reported at that memo level sums them up into the, the total expenditure. So um, we can make the detail available if you want to, but at the moment they're presented that way in the LTP. I'll get that information to you offline. The main thing is that it's in there, right, Sharon? <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. Burns has already had some questions, so I'm going to go to the next on the list, which is um, Deputy Mayor Lawrence Bibby. Thank I'll you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question from me uh, on page 281 and 82 of the appendices. This is our um, remission for DCs for community housing. Um, I know in a previous workshop we've talked about this particular uh, policy and uh, I, I raised in that workshop about the fact that there doesn't seem to be any protection from future changes of housing that was built as community housing in future being no longer community housing um, as a way around paying full DCs. Um, there doesn't seem to be anywhere in that particular policy where that protection is uh, is created, if that makes sense. Just raising, if we did that get any further than at that workshop conversation? I'm not sure who's going to answer that question, but. Is there a page number there? <laughs> Go to Chris for a comment. Okay, 
We're just waiting for Chris Pavan. Microphone, please. Oh, sorry, I was just waiting for the light. Um, uh, so in relation to our DC policy, um, we uh, obviously had um, talked to you and um, that is reflected in this material, um, the remissions policy, um, which does incorporate a narrow um, definition of what we've called community housing, which would relate um, to social housing. Um, so there is a remission through there, but it needs to meet the requirements that we've set in that policy, if that makes sense. So the detail is in there, is I guess um, what I'm sharing. Is there a question you had around that detail specifically though? We're waiting for Councillor Kirby's microphone. My, my concern is, um, I guess my question is why is there no protection for future changes of housing from community to just standard available um, given a time frame after we've given them a remission on their DCs? Does that make sense? So for example, Councillor Kirby's microphone's just dropped out. He has a further point to make. Yep. Just to clarify, give an example of potentially what could happen. You have a developer come in, uh, they develop a piece of land with a portion that fits our remissions policy. Um, a portion of their houses are delegated as community housing um, and they get a reduced development contribution for those houses as part of the bigger development. Um, given future, what protection is there that those community and social housing that we gave a remission to in the future aren't converted back into full public housing for anyone to use and they're not social and community? Um, does that, it's a way around the DC, full paying full DCs. Given Such enough an time. Question: We've got two people fighting to answer it. I'll go to Chris first. Um, yeah, that, uh, that point is, is, is a great question. Um, uh, effectively, um, we will be monitoring um, that um, particular issue. Um, I think part of the reason when we were looking at the changes to the DC policy and why the remissions policy is separate from our wider DC policy now is it's something new we're introducing and we're going to test it and monitor it before we'd be um, bringing that into the main policy on a more permanent basis. But it will be through resource consents and the monitoring of that that will be ensuring that I think what I hear you saying is that um, the uh, intention of um, that remission um, holds over time. So so that's something we're going to monitor. And if there's any issues that um, crop up, we'll be um, looking at whether we need to review any of the details in our policy. And I do know that Sean's got something to add to that. Yes, I, um, I don't, we haven't looked at that specific issue, not that I'm aware of in detail, but you could look to incorporate a, a consent notice on the title or look at some sort of encumbrance probably a consent notice at the time of subdivision that uh, is linked to the 224 process that would specify a link to that use for the dwelling. So that that would, could be one way we look to do that. Um, uh, but we could certainly go out and, and formalise that as to how we're going to do that in conjunction with the monitoring. But that would then give you something that's linked to the title and then uh, it makes it very clear as to the purpose of that um, that development or that property. Yeah, I think the key word that you just said is formalised, mm. so that we ensure that that happens. Mm. Councillor Kirby? Yeah, I would I would be um, hesitant to approve a, a policy that we have in existence that is not tight enough to protect us from uh, that particular thing happening. Monitoring and, and saying something around resource consent. If I've got resource consent for a property, I'm never going to come back to get that resource consent changed. Um, so that trigger point doesn't seem to work, so it would have to be something on the title. So um, I guess for me is 
uh, can we please look at how we can put that into this policy before we make it formal that we've got some protection on the title of community housing that we have given a remission to. Does that make sense? So, uh, Thank you. So we need to be approving these documents today as part of our suite of documents for our long-term plan consultation document to go out to consultation, but they're in draft. So we can note that and when we bring back the final um, document, then we'll make sure that those provisions are in there. Do you, would you be comfortable that staff take that away and make that happen, or would you like to move a, um, an additional recommendation, which I've started to write here, to ensure that it happens? Um, I would be comfortable with leaving that to the process as we go through consultation period and bring long-term plan back for final approval. Um, and I will just make a note myself that, that I will ensure that that is in there somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. I think that closes off that discussion. Uh, Councillor Wilson? Um, yep. Um, just what, whilst while Sam's here, if there's any, if people got any questions relating to the audit, I think that would be great. Otherwise, I want to move the recommendation. Hang this on a minute. Darren had something to add to the previous discussion. No, well, yes. Before we do that, and yep. I'd quite like to move the. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Wilson. I, I did just want to add in the definitions, the, the community housing provider must be a CHIP. So they've got to be a registered CHIP and the housing is provided for long-term rental. So common sense would suggest that if they were to change the development or the primary purpose of the houses, there would be a process that they would need to go through. So, 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 so there's a level of certainty in the de definition of, so, so we were deliberate and being quite tight on what the remission applied for, but if, if, if that doesn't that doesn't meet the need, uh, then we're happy to, to look at something further. So we'll just go back to Councillor Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Edwards, for that uh, clarification. I, um, when housing is concerned, we're talking about a 50 plus year term um, and things can fall by the wayside. Uh, so that's my concern is if we are wanting more community housing and more social housing that exists for a long period of time in our community, we've got to be as robust as possible, not just around a definition. Because I know chips won't exist potentially in 30 years time, they may not be existent anymore, in which case all of that stuff. So I just, I, it's where my concern is. Thank you. And it, and it will be addressed. <clears throat> so, Mr Burns, did you have any more questions before I move these recommendations? Yes, just one question. One question, okay. Uh, in the consultation document going out, well, it's planned to go out, it recommends 17% in the first year and a less increase further on. Uh, I see some disadvantages with that in terms of public perception, affordability. What, what's the advantage of that spike in that first year? for rates increases as opposed to spreading it out? Through you, Your Worship. So the question is, what's the advantage of having 17% in year one, 7% in years two to, t two to 10? And then the question is, can't you smooth it out? Um, so, We've done we've done a number of, of public briefings. So there are um, there are there are seventeen percent of cost increases facing the council in year one, um, which is set out in the consultation document. Nine point six percent of that is unavoidable costs, and then you start to get in the realms of um, loss of um, crown funding from better off. Um, four point seven million dollar shortfall to fund the three waters. So, if you address that in year one, you don't need to address that in years two onwards. So, um, if you did the smoothing effect and dropped seventeen, um, the council uh, initially, when we when we when the three waters reform was still on the table, the council laws got the rates increase of year one to twelve. Uh, that's as low as we could go. 
fast forward, change of government, there's no longer that, that funding that was a one-off. So 17% allows us to maintain the current levels of service in year one, and then from years two to 10, the 7% is allowing you to do that plus reduce your debt. So um, we looked at that smoothing impact. If you, if you change the profile to what we've got and you try and smooth it out, um, you start to change the whole financial strategy. You, 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 you start to change the whole thrust of what the long-term plan is trying to achieve. Um, but behind the 17% and the 7% is a, is a detailed look at all our costs, a detailed look at affordability, and um, it's also underpinning our strategic objectives. So uh, in terms of the profile that we've got, it's, a, it's, it's more sensible than smoothing it out. You've got to cover your costs in year one, and our costs are sitting at a 17% rates increase. So if we don't cover that by rates, we're going to increase our debt. So it's, it's laid out in the consultation document and the financial strategy, the reasoning behind what we see in front of us. I'll remind everybody again, though, that this is a consultation document and any comments will be received and feed into the final long-term plan. Mm. So I'm not seeing any more questions. I would like to move these recommendations. They, they're all kind of intertwined, so I'm going to move them all at once. I'm just we're swapping between the appendices and the agenda today. I'll just pull them back up. They're on the screen in front of us. So there's A there, which is a suite of supporting documents. There's B, the consultation document, and C, which authorises the Mayor and the Chief Executive to make some minor editorial changes, and we've had at least one of those identified today. Uh, I, I believe uh, Councillor Wilson is enthusiastic about seconding this. Um, yes. So, um, yeah, I'd just like to thank Council staff. I know uh, it's been a long journey alongside our auditors, and I'd like to acknowledge again Sam for coming along today. I think he's ducked out now. Um, Cheryl, Mark, and the team, thank you so much for the work that's gone in. I know a lot of councils around the country have decided not to have their consultation documents audited, and we decided to go through that process to ensure that we had something which was robust and which would uh, stand up in the next process so that we can improve our credit rating as is our aspiration and ensure um, resilience in the future and try to balance that with affordability. So that's in the context of a nationwide funding problem which is being addressed at a sector level um, through local government New Zealand and it's a conversation that we desperately need to have. Um, just yesterday, we already received an email from a resident with some suggestions about how to fix the funding mechanism across the country. So we welcome those emails, and I've passed them straight on to the President of Local Government New Zealand and uh, the Chief Executive, and it's going to go into their funding toolbox. So any suggestions will go through and form part of our, the work that we're doing to try and address this issue where the rates funding model is no longer fit for purpose in the longer term to be affordable for our community. And in the meantime, we're putting forward a proposal for a way that we think that we can keep our organisation and our community viable, keep our assets up to scratch, and make sure that we re repay debt in future years. Yes, why, is there a, why is there an echo? Somebody just jumped online. So so with that, I will invite uh, comments from councillors. Councillor Wilson. Um, yeah, uh, just to say this is a, um, a very robust and well-traversed document, um, bits of which we would uh, individually agree with or disagree with, but that's not the point of this. It's a consultation document um, to go out to the public the financial brutalism that is applied to these things by audit, I think have, they've done a good job. And the fact that we have gone and got an audit, an unqualified audit position, I think is really excellent. That should give, that should give the public um, some comfort about how robust the figures are and that, that, that they stand up. Um, 
that it's an independently audited document. Um, the uh, yeah, and just just lastly, in terms of the the actual document itself, I think it's incredibly readable. Um, sometimes these things are really dry and they're horrible, and they they kind of invite disdain from the public, so you don't get much of a response. This is, I think, is a really good document, so I think we'll get feedback from it, and just would urge the community to to have their say. Councillor Spires. Thank you. Um, while I support this document going out for public consultation, personally I do not do not support the 17% at this point in time. So I'm looking forward to the feedback from the community, but I just also wanted to thank Mark and his team for all the work and hours and hours that have gone into this document. It's, it's really good, but so I just wanted to say that. So thank you, Mark. Councillor Halliday. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, like others, firstly, I wanted to acknowledge the public briefings, workshops, and the pivoting that's been uh, facilitated by council officers, um, and the preparation of both this plan and the consultation documents over at least the last six months, and hence that's been my lack of questions. As everyone knows, I'm always one to throw questions around. Um, I have voiced my concern around the rates increase over the last three annual plans and the last long-term plan, and I'm gagging on what we are proposing. Um, uh, in this, um, but this is a consultation document, and we need to tell the story as it is, which I do believe we're doing here, especially in relation to our debt situation, but also with the escalated costs. Today we were challenged for mismanagement. I'd like to compare our water situation with Wellington's. We are in a substantially better position to them and other regional councils because we planned and invested, and we have the debt to prove it. But that debt principle has to be paid off at some point, and this has to be addressed, which this document addresses. I know we've had, uh, I know that we've been preparing two annual plans, uh, or long-term plans, one that included three waters and one that didn't, and I'm afraid we don't have the luxury of assumption. I'll put it bluntly, the current rating system is not fit for purpose, New Zealand wide. That is my opinion. Funding. Funding is required to come back from central taxation pool in a more meaningful way, again, my opinion. It happens with roading. It needs to happen with other essential infrastructure as well. I'll be supporting this document to go out for consultation, and I appreciate it is challenging, and I will be very, very interested in the submissions that come through because, believe it or not, we do read them. We are members of this community, and we do take them on board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Halliday. Councillor Coe. Um, look, I'm, I'm fully in support of uh, uh, the, the strategies that are embedded in these documents. Um, I, th I think it's absolutely critical that we reduce our debt. We are playing catch up on uh, things that have happened in the past in that regard. But we are fortunate in that we have infrastructure that's in reasonably good shape. We've taken steps to ensure we're running a very efficient, effective operation. We've, um, we've uh, taken a razor to our proposed capital expenditure in order to keep our debt under control. As painful as it is, I think it's essential that we go down this path. And I know 17% sounds like a huge um, rates increase, but to put it in perspective, LGNZ have said that on average throughout the country, uh, we're looking at 15 point something or other percent um, increases through through um, you know, all our, our local councils. So we are on par with what's happening around the country. The government is to blame for a lot of this. They're asking us to do more and more with less and less. Um, and you know we have had huge increases, as, as uh, Mr. Shan pointed out earlier that the, the consumer's price index bears no relation to the local government index, which reflects the costs of the operations that, that we undertake. So uh, using the CPI as a benchmark uh, for rates increases is just completely inappropriate. So we have to suck it up, I'm afraid. It's painful. Uh, but unless we uh, start on this path of debt reduction, um, we are on a, you know, we're, we're going to just make things even more painful down the track. So let's just deal with it, um, tighten our belts a couple of notches, 
and put ourselves in a strong position uh, going forward. So, yeah, I, I just, uh, you know, would beseech the community to get in behind what we're doing, which to me is a brave move and, and the right move. So, um, yeah, I just, I hope that um, the community can see that uh, we are acting with absolutely the best intentions long term. Thank you. Uh, Mr Burns. <coughs> yes, uh, I, I acknowledge the work of staff and councillors. You've, you've done a massive amount of work the last several months. I, I would like to say, though, I believe 17% recommendation is, is, is way too high. Uh, and I do recall Mr Shan mentioning that the operational matters hasn't been really looked at, and I agree with him. I believe efficiencies can be found in operational matters, and that some er some, uh, that's an area that needs to be closely examined and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Councillor Hanford. Yeah, just also keeping it nice and brief, would like to thank staff and also just recognise the agility in the process uh, and just how quickly people have had to work and beaver away um, to reflect comments and questions that we've had and that we've had ample time and space to tease out, so just acknowledging you for that. Um, and also through the process so far, I've really appreciated the opportunity to balance the conversation around affordability with also intergenerational equity and thinking about um, what our community really wants and needs and actually what we can achieve together through the fact that we obviously need to charge rates and the economic climate now means that that, <coughs> that rates increase does need to, as Councillor Coe pointed out, be higher. But I think there's a real job that we have through the consultation process to tell that story and to get the message out there about just how much council does and and is now needing <coughs> to continue to do with the likes of Three Waters still being with us um, to, to really tell that story. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity the consultation process will give us to, um, to have that conversation with our community and to hear what they have to say um, coming back through the process. So yeah, really just wanted to acknowledge you for all the work and also acknowledge the auditors and others who have been involved in what has been a massive process to this point and will continue to, I'm sure, create a lot more work, but is really important uh, and looking forward to seeing the outcome. Any further comments? So just before we put this to a vote, I'd just like to make a couple more comments about the work that's gone in so far as we create this consultation document including the work that's gone into revising our capital expenditure program to be much tighter, um, not to identify more work than we can achieve and introducing flexibility into the prioritisation of that work program so that we can bring um, the projects forward, which is something that the previous chair of the Risk and Assurance, which was then called the uh, Audit and Risk Committee, encouraged us to do through the last long-term plan and which we've been able to implement through this long-term plan. So able to find some significant efficiencies across our capital works program. Also reducing our operational increases um, by over 50% and um, according to the chief executive's um, suggestion, introducing a staff cap. So, um, so we'll put that out for consultation. We'll see. What, uh, what people think, whether they think that further efficiencies can be found. Um, we'll all keep an open mind as we hear from the community and uh, we look forward to hearing what people have to say. Just reiterating Councillor Wilson's comment, really encouraging people to feedback and tell us their thoughts about what we're presenting today. So with that, I'll put those um, recommendations, A, B and C, all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? That's carried. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, <coughs> Treasury Management Policy, we've finished that paper now. I, okay, I was just noting Councillor Cooper not in the room uh, with regards to that vote. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, we'll note that Councillor Cooper wasn't at the table. Thank you for that, Councillor Halliday. So we'll move on to the next paper, which is a Treasury Management Policy, and we'll just uh, deal with this one before we take a break, if that's okay. Uh, point of clarification, Madam Chair. Um, I note that within this document, it states that this policy should be approved by the Strategy Operations and Finance Committee. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I can talk to that. It, e even if it's delegated to the 
Strategy Operations and Finance Committee, which I'm not sure about, council can consider any business of council, yes, whether it's it delegated not, or not. But it hasn't been to It doesn't have to, it has, doesn't have to. Um, councillor, council can consider, and probably it's a matter of time frames, but council can consider any business of council. The delegation just allows it to be um, considered by another mm -hmm. committee. It doesn't mean it has to be. I'm just that, I'll pass to Mark, who might have a bit more to say about that as well before we start. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, look, I've, I've got a few things to to say about the report, but first of all, I'd like to um, introduce to you Miles O'Connor. Um, to my left, um, Miles is the uh, manager corporate services of Bancorp Treasury Services. Um, Bancorp is the council's um, independent treasury advisor. So, a as the report says, we work very closely with Bancorp, um, particularly um, with our debt issuance. All debt issuances are first checked and discussed with Miles and the team, um, as well as our hedging. So when we are looking at our interest rate swaps, um, we do actually um, work very closely with Bancorp. So it's uh, it's very, very important that Council has an independent Treasury advisor, particularly with the, the scale of the debt that we have and what we're managing. So that's just a brief introduction to Miles. I will hand over to Miles in a minute. He will take you through a, a, a um, presentation. But before I do, I just wanted to issue an apology. There are a couple of things, there are a couple of anomalies in, in this report. Um, paragraph 9 should have been taken out. Um, so there is a little bit of confusion. So appendix, uh, the appendix to the report um, is, is, is intended to show the track changes of the recommendations by Bancorp, um, as well as uh, by Bancorp, and appendix 2 is actually just the current uh, Treasury management policy. Uh, what, what the report sets out, so, so fundamentally, um, we'll hear from Miles soon. So what we wanted to convey to you is we do need to adopt a new Treasury management policy as part of the long-term plan uh, supporting documentations. But the changes that um, Bancorp are recommending are quite big. So I wanted you to understand that. And apologies, some of the change recommendations from Bancorp aren't shown in the markups on Appendix 1. So that's my bad. We've had a bit of aversion control. So apologies for that. Um, there is reference to strategy and operations committee. So one of the recommendations is that we are, we are seeking delegation to the mayor and the chief executive to make subsequent editorial changes to reflect the, covent, the current governance structure and delegation. So this, this policy, um, the intention is we would like you to approve the big changes and then I would like the time to, to go through um, the policy uh, pegs to various committees. The Risk and Assurance Committee, which was the Audit and Risk Committee, the Strategy and Operations Committee, which is now the Strategy, Operations and Finance Committee. So I think what we need to do is just take a little bit of time and sort of align it to a relevant committee, not name the committee, because every time we change the name of a committee, we have to change the policy. So those are the minor editorial uh, changes. That's housekeeping. What I really want you to understand and see today, the significant changes that we are asking you to approve. Um, and it's mainly to do with how we manage um, our debt maturities, how we manage our hedging instruments. Um, there's a bit about taking managed funds out um, and our, our counterparty credit limits with where we invest our money. Those are the, those are the four big items. Um, that we're asking or seeking your approval to change. So um, I, I do apologise. Uh, the report is a little bit untidy. There's some, some of the references aren't quite accurate. Um, this has happened through the version control. It should have been picked up. It got past the goalkeeper, which was me. Um, but the, the main point of today is to table with you some, some big proposed changes to our Treasury management policy, and Miles, Miles will tell you why. So over to Miles. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for the opportunity of presenting to you today. Um, <clears throat> I had the pleasure of staying for the first time in my life last night in Kapiti Coast. Never done it before and stayed in Raumati, and I thought it was wonderful. So I um, never realised how it was a bit of, it's a bit of a gem for me. <laughs> What's that, sorry? <laughs> There's some parochialism going on. Oh, so I'm, fr I'm from Christchurch, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, just to add, just 
briefly what Mark said about Bangkok Treasury. We're, we're totally independent. We're a merchant bank who are based in Auckland. I work out of the Christchurch office, and we advise uh, corporate and institutional clients on managing their treasury risks, uh, and that can incorporate several facets. And for councils, it's uh, the two pr predominant ones are managing funding and managing interest rate risks. We are the biggest treasury advisor in Australasia, as we understand it. Um, we have one main competitor. We act, I think, for about 35 local authorities around the country, so um, you know, we have a lot of experience. It's our biggest sector that we actually advise on. Um, and it's uh, just listening down the back you know, to some of the conversations you're having. I've been travelling for the last two, two months and going around local authorities, and I think everyone's facing the same problems that you are, and it's, you know, it's rates affordability and um, debt levels and capital expenditure, so you're certainly not alone in that one. Um, and I realise it's a pretty challenging time for you, but sorry, that's probably just going off, off track a wee bit. Um, we do have the changes, as Mark said, just one or two um, section differentials that we've got in here. But I don't know, um, <coughs> I, don't, I probably don't need to go through all of them, but um, uh, I'm not sure that maybe if I just start at uh, section... Is that, that's section 11 on your yeah, report, isn't it? The, paragraph, parag 11. paragraph 11, the borrowing mechanisms. Uh, we just need to delete one bullet point in the actual underlying section 21. Um, that's it, you're okay with that one? Yeah. Um, oh, so we're, in we're, we're on page 10 of the agenda. I think yeah, take it right. as read, yep. do your presentation, and then we'll take okay. questions. Yeah. I'm just thinking that this isn't going to. Okay, so do we have a presentation around this? Mm -hmm. and then we'll talk uh, well, the, the main, actually, probably the main one, if I just make two or three points, which are, which are the key sure. ones. Yeah. So it relates to um, paragraph 18, which refers to the interest rate control limits in section 74. So there's all this cross-referencing, which does make it a wee bit confusing. Um, so what we're proposing is that the existing bands that you've got, which are, which are in the Treasury policy, incorporate a master control band and then a swap, a swaps maturity profile. To be quite honest, we don't totally understand it. We think we do, but this wasn't written by us. It was written by uh, a predecessor to, to Bancorp. <laughs> and, um, And uh, we're not sure how to interpret it, actually. And we think we know what they're, what they're intending, but we're not totally sure. We find it difficult to manage the Treasury risks based on these parameters. And we understand that the originator of these parameters now no longer uses them, and they actually use ones that are very similar to ours. So uh, that's probably the important point on that one. And what we're trying to do is simplify it, make it easier to... Into, make it easier to manage, make it easier to understand. And um, I mean, I've asked some councils who use them, well, you know, how do you interpret these? And they say, well, we don't know. We just tell it, um, we're just told that we're policy compliant. I said, okay, well, I think it's important that you should actually understand the band. So what we're doing is proposing deleting the existing ones, which is the master control band, and then the swaps maturity profile, and replacing it with the um, fixed to floating parameters, which are detailed in point uh, sorry, par paragraph 18. So, 18, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, so that's the main one, and the only other two which I'll mention are the funding control limits. You have funding control limits, which is the maturity profile of your debt. Um, it's broken down into four time buckets. We're proposing a slightly simpler solution, is saying that no more than 40% of debt shall mature in any rolling 12-month period. The reason for that is that you get a whole lot of concentration of debt in year one, obvious, uh, quite often in year one if you're using what's called commercial paper. And it actually, again, sometimes it, it, you have to micromanage exposures just to control, just to um, comply with the Treasury policy, and it actually doesn't add anything to it. In fact, it can, it can add to costs. And the last point is the um, we replace the policy with, uh, the, the investment policy with the new one in Appendix 3, which is a catch-all phrase, uh, which is a catch-all matrix dealing with um, 
investments. So it's financial market investments. It's not property. It's not equities. It's financial market investments. And what it's done, what it's trying to do is future proof you for um, if there is an, uh, an expansion of your invest financial market investment activities. It makes you jump through about five hoops, but it's necessary to preserve the integrity of your assets. Um, it's, it's worth doing. So um, those are the, those are the, the three big points that I think that we're changing. <coughs> that. Um, I'll go to Councillor Wilson to ask questions. Yeah, just to um, Comrade Coe's point, um, they, I'm not entirely sure that this is the appropriate venue, uh, and I'll tell you for why. Um, so, for instance, um, I, I'm reasonably sharp on this stuff, but it's there's a lot of information in here that ha that there hasn't been a huge amount of time to digest. There are some significant debate points, which I'm not entirely sure this is the first place that they should be debated. Like, for instance, on point 46, managed funds, council may invest in shares and other financial instruments. Um, uh, Truth Social shares, or, or you know, um, that's kind of like the TAB for suits, the share market for me. The d discussion around that kind of thing, I would have thought was appropriate to have at um, either at the soft committee, and the people whose opinion I really respect on this stuff um, uh, uh, in the audit and risk committee, and so I'd really like to have given them an opportunity, they might not want to, but um, I'd really like to have given them an opportunity to go through this and make it simple. Um, financial literacy isn't something that comes to everybody naturally, and some of this stuff is quite complex. And But we are being asked to make a quite significant decision um, that could have serious implications with probably, in my case, any, my, perhaps I'm just the ignorant one in the room, wouldn't be the first time, B, I don't feel like I have enough information right now. And, and I would, would have liked a little more discussion, debate, analysis, etc., from people, and, and, to, 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 oh, and I wouldn't want to put the Davids, you know, just throw them under the bus and say, right, come up with a brilliant answer now. <laughs> Your time starts now. So, yeah. Mark's going to yeah. answer that. Yeah, through, through you, Your Worship. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, look, I know we had, a, um, we had a briefing last week and I, I just alluded to the fact that um, uh, unfortunately uh, one of the supporting documents for the consultation document because of the financial strategy has to be a Treasury management policy. Um, it is unfortunate. We haven't had the time uh, previously uh, to take you through these changes. We've, we've been looking at these changes for some time with Bancorp. So, um, so one, one of the challenges that we have is that we have to have a Treasury management policy um, as a supporting document for the consultation document which you've, you've just adopted. Um, the changes that we're proposing to the Treasury Management Policy uh, reflect the changes that uh, all other councils are managing. So I appreciate that we haven't had the time to go through. The, um, the, the point about the Strategy Ops Committee, so, so at, at, at the moment our, our current Treasury Management Policy sets, um, sets rules around uh, where compliance with the Treasury Policy is reported to. But the actual um, the delegation to change a Treasury policy actually sits with the Council. So um, at the moment, we report compliance quarterly to Risk and Assurance. Um, and we used to report compliance annually to the Strategy and Ops Committee. Now we only report compliance. So, um, so is it the right place? So only Council can adopt a new Treasury management policy. Um, we we do need to have something on, on our website. Um, the financial strategy or the new draft financial strategy um, is governed by these changes. So um, might I suggest, um, Miles has a presentation to take you through. Uh, these, we could certainly come back and do another session with the council to explain them in more detail. 
Um, but the, these changes aren't my changes. These are changes by independent experts. Um, I understand the changes. They make sense to me. Um, and we have a presentation where um, they may make more sense to you. But I, I, take, I take the point that we haven't uh, given you an opportunity to fully digest and understand these changes, and I apologise for that. So we, we are under a time frame. We need to make this decision today to support our um, long-term plan consultation document. I have a suggested way around that I've, um, I've just discussed with the Chief Executive and that is that we adopt these changes today in recognition of the fact that Bancorp have been working closely with our staff on them and we have had the opportunity to read this agenda and provide feedback as the Deputy Mayor I know has done. Uh, these papers have also been, um, have been uh, provided to our risk and assurance members mm -hmm. who've had also had a chance to have a look through them. It's, we've, we've uh, identified that the process hasn't been ideal and somewhat affected by the uh, auditing process for the long-term plan consultation document. So my suggestion is that we adopt these changes today, but in order to acknowledge the delegation which has been given to strategy operations and finance, we then present this with its changes in a clear format with the report to strategy operations and finance, at which time we'll have a, t have a chance to inform ourselves more fully as we go through. Does that sound like a way forward that people would be happy with? It then also, um, it then also clearly places this document in strategy operations and finance where it, it, it should live. But we need to adopt it today as part of the process to release our long-term plan consultation document. So I would like us to consider seriously, you know, how we proceed today. I've got quite a lot of lights on. Have you got questions about the paper or about the process? Councillor Coe? Um, yeah, look, I, I think we're being sort of forced down a path here, which is unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Um, I, you know, if you asked the people around this room to explain what a spot maturity profile is, I think you'd get a bit of a blank look on most people's faces, and I think uh, we're being asked to, um, uh, you know, vote, if you like, on, on recommendations that are not fully understood. So I'm just, I think there needs to be an opportunity to revisit this. I think we obviously need to get something out there because that's the process, but I think we need to leave the way open that this can go back to strategy ops and finance, or maybe we have a separate briefing on uh, the changes that are being proposed, so people are uh, a bit more fully informed of the some of the jargon and what lies in behind it, and that we uh, can somehow, you know, make further changes down the track if it's appropriate. I mean, there's there are revision dates noted in the document. Can we play around with that to? to say, well, it will be revised, um, you know, before we sign off on the on the, um, the long-term plan. I've just suggested to the Chief Executive that this is brought to, we've got two strategy operations and finance committee meetings coming mm. up, and I'm suggesting that it goes to the second of those. I'm getting a yeah. nod from the Chair, and there'll be a chance to discuss things at that point. So I think you're pretty much suggesting the same thing as what I just suggested. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, and also that delegation rests with the strategy operations and finance from reading of the policy to make changes. Mm. So that door is open, as I understand it. Um, does that complete your line of questioning? Yep. yep. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, mean, I do think, I, I'm not sure where we stand, because I ha we haven't got apparently the, uh, the latest version in front of us. There's still reference in there to the growth fund. Um, is, is that coming out? Yeah, thank you. So um, I think it's paragraph 23. I, I've actually said that. Um, so officer recommendations is to remove the whole section on managed funds. 
there is no growth there is no growth fund and yeah. there is no resilience fund and the resilience yeah. fund resembles a self insurance fund and a growth yeah. fund rep re uh, represents right. an so investment all fund out. all that so yeah. the recommendation is to yeah. take that out and the further okay. recommendation the officer recommendation was to tidy up the reference to old committees right right okay yeah. so it's not clear with what we've got in front of us that that's the case but anyway yeah. right yeah okay thank you thank you that's really helpful um deputy mayor my, I've, I've got a question around this. Um, can we change this from approving a policy to approving a draft that goes out alongside the other draft policies that sit as associated? If we attach this as draft, then we've got all the time in the world up until the end of June to bring the changes, to have the briefings, to bring it back to committees and to fine tune it and understand it. So when we pass it, the LTP, whatever that looks like in June, We've had the time to do this, but let's make it draft. Let's not make it a. There's no reference here to this becoming a draft from today. Maybe that's a way that we could just add extra. This is a draft. We're working on it. Is that possible under the legislation? Listen to staff uh, to press their microphones and answer a question. Uh, thank you. Yes, we can do that. We can make it a draft. Councillor Pavanov. Thank you through the Chair. So um, I echo the concerns of my fellow councillors and it's great that we've now got a solution moving forward. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of points that I think also need to be clarified. So the document is actually dated December 2023 and, and it's unfortunate that it's only come to us now. But I suppose what I think also needs to be done is on page three, it shows the version tracking. And I don't know whether this version that we have now is actually the December 2023 version or whether it's actually been updated since then. And it would be great to have that table updated as well, please. Thank you. Comment noted. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Yes, having been somewhat critical <coughs> earlier, I'd be happy to recommend this, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to move this, but we would need to have uh, a further recommendation in there that this be, that we are doing this as a draft, as, as has been suggested. We, the mechanism by which it gets re-examined is something that we could do in the, <coughs> wouldn't need to be in here, I wouldn't think. But, um, uh, yeah, but subject to that, because at the mo as it sits at the moment, there's a there's a quite a bit of a you know trust us, we know what we're doing, which is great. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody does. Um, so uh, yeah, subject to adding that in, um, which I think would satisfy, what would satisfy me. What about others? Yeah, we'll just um, we'll have a look at the recommendations and come back to you, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Kirby? Can I suggest we adjourn while we put those, reword those recommendations? That's a really good idea. So we'll adjourn, we'll come back at 25-2. Uh,